Right then, here we are once again inside the wonderful world of War Thunder, where today we're taking a little look at everyone's favourite reserve tank, the Light Tank M2A4. Now some of you might be thinking, yeah, ain't he already done a video about that there, whatchamacallit? And you, my dear viewer, would be absolutely correct. Nothing's getting past you today, is it? Yes, I've already done a video about the M2A4. However, that is a very old video, and doesn't go into the historical and technical details in the slightest. Which is why I'm making a new one about it in the correct format. Speaking of correct formats, as I'm sure you know, you very astute and might I say devilishly handsome viewer, I'll be talking about the history and technical details first, which means that I have descended from the mountain bearing a tablet on which is inscribed a time code, which I have placed in the video description, and will allow you to skip all the fun and go straight to the battle. For the rest of us, let's put down our hot dogs and hand grenades, and gaze reverently at the history of the light tank M2A4. Now, some of you may notice that I've already done a video on the Light Tank M2A2. Although this video is rather short, it is still in the new format. The first such video, in fact. Therefore, today's story shall start where that one left off. If you want to see how far this channel has come since then, I'd recommend giving that video a watch. Although I should warn you, it's a bit crap. The light tank M2A2 was manufactured from 1936 to 1937, during which time 239 examples were built, quickly becoming the primary tank of the US infantry, although it was never used in combat and was only ever deployed in training roles. In 1937, it was decided to produce an improved tank based on the M2A2. This vehicle, designated Light Tank M2A3, was essentially the same as its predecessor, but featured a longer hull with more widely spaced suspension bogies. This was done to reduce ground pressure in order to compensate for the tank's increased weight. This weight gain was caused by the increase of the frontal armour thicknesses from 15.8mm, or 0.6 inches, to 25mm, or just under 1 inch. The armament of a single Browning M2HB heavy machine gun and a Browning M1919A4 medium machine gun in two side-by-side -side turrets along with another M1919 in the hull remained the same. However, even as production of the M2A3 was beginning, the United States Army, who had been paying attention to developments of the combat technology in Europe, and most significantly the Spanish Civil War, came to realise that a tank armed with only a machine gun, even a heavy machine gun, was not going to cut it when it came to modern warfare. How was it supposed to deal with infantry hiding behind hard cover, or in buildings? How can a machine gun destroy a pillbox or gun emplacement? And perhaps most importantly, how was America's current stock of machine gun armed tanks supposed to fight other tanks? In response to these questions, the US infantry decided to request a new light tank armed with a proper anti-tank gun. Therefore, just after 72 light tank M2A3s had been produced, production was halted. One example was removed from the production line to form the basis for the new design. The armour was increased to 1 inch, or 25mm, all round. The engine remained the same, a single 262 horsepower Continental W670 7-cylinder radial petrol engine. However, it was shifted back a little to increase the tank's fuel capacity. This required raising the rear end of the engine deck, but this had the added benefit of simplifying the tank's hull design, reducing manufacturing time and costs slightly. The weapon chosen for the new tank was the 37mm M5 anti-tank gun. This gun was too large to fit inside one of the two side-by-side -side turrets, and so they were removed. In their place, a large two-man turret was installed. This turret featured no turret baskets or even seats for the crew, so they had to shuffle around as the turret turned, taking care not to trip over the drive shaft. Next to the M5 gun, a coaxial Browning M1919A4 machine gun was installed. However, the US Ordnance Department said, More machine guns, dagnammit! 
And so, an anti-aircraft machine gun was added to a pintle on the rear of the turret, operated by someone standing on the engine deck. In addition, as well as the hull machine gun that was retained from the M2A3, two more Browning M1919A4 machine guns were added to the sponsons on either side of the crew compartment. These were fixed in place and operated by the driver. The new tank, designated Light Tank M2A4, was submitted to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds in 1939, where it was decided to add some improvements. These included the addition of a commander's cupola, Cupola. Cupola. The reduction of the gun barrel's length by 13 centimetres to prevent it from snagging comically on obstacles while the turret was turning, and the installation of two horizontal brackets on the upper glacis to make climbing onto the tank easier, as well as to encourage bullets to ricochet. The new tank was approved for production in October 1939, and the first M2A4s were turned out by May 1940. Production was undertaken by the American Car and Foundry Company, which is notable as one of the first indications that the United States was ramping up its wartime production industries, as all previous American tanks had been produced by the Rock Island Arsenal. 365 examples were built by the time production switched to the light tank M3 in March 1941. However, an additional 10 fitted with Guibeson T1020 radial diesel engines were manufactured by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in April 1941. At the time of its introduction, the M2A4 was likely the best light tank in the world, combining a powerful 37mm gun with very high mobility for its time, capable of reaching speeds of 36 miles per hour, or 58 kilometers per hour. However, the M3 light tank that replaced it just before the Americans joined with the war was slightly better, and so the M2A4's capabilities were doomed to be overshadowed. The light tank M2A4 was primarily used for training, remaining in this role until December 1942, where it was replaced in this role by the light tank M3. The light tank M2A4 was the first American tank to be distributed under the Lend-Lease program. 36 examples were sent to Great Britain in the spring of 1941, and were used by the 9th Queen's Royal Lancers for training. The M2A4 did not receive a fancy codename like its successor, the M3, which was called the Stuart by the British, for it arrived in the country just before such codenames were employed. The only occasion where the M2A4 may have been used in combat by the British was in Burma in 1942, by the 7th Armoured Brigade, however, this is not confirmed. It is confirmed, and well documented, however, that the light tank M2A4 was used in American service in combat. The US Marine Corps was low on the requisition list for equipment in the US military, meaning that they often had to make do with whatever the other branches didn't want anymore. And so, when the Marines were tasked with taking Guadalcanal, A Company of the 1st Tank Battalion of the 1st Marine Division was equipped with a hodgepodge of armoured fighting vehicles, including 36 M2A4s. During the battle, it was found that the M2A4 coped with fighting the Japanese defenders just as readily as the better armoured M3 and M3A1s. They were used primarily in support of marine infantry, engaging Japanese emplacements and infantry using canister shot, which essentially turned the 37mm gun into a giant shotgun. Typically, the M2A4s were paired with M3 light tanks so that they could cover each other against Japanese infantry, who had taken to attacking American tanks using satchel charges, often suicidally. During the Battle of Guadalcanal, however, it was decided that the 37mm gun of the M2A4 and M3 light tanks was inadequate in dealing with Japanese bunkers, and so by the time the Battle of Cape Gloucester in December 1943, the Marine M2A4s were replaced with medium tank M4s. The Marines retained their M2A4s for training until the end of the war, at which point they were all scrapped. Only one light tank M2A4 is known to exist today. 
during the battle for Henderson Field, which was the main Japanese airbase on the island of Guadalcanal, a tank of A Company of the 1st Tank Battalion became stuck in swampy ground and was abandoned in October 1942. It sat there for 67 years before being recovered by a private collector in 2009. It is currently under restoration and is likely to be in fully working order soon enough. And now it's time to take a little look at the light tank M2A4 inside the wonderful world of War Thunder. Right then, here we have the light tank M2A4 inside the wonderful world of War Thunder. Look at it there, isn't it lovely? In War Thunder, the M2A4 is a Rank 1 Battle Rating 1.0 Reserve Light Tank of the United States. It has a crew of four, the Commander Slash Gunner, the Loader, the Driver and the Assistant Driver. The power plant consists of a single 262 horsepower or 193 kilowatt Continental W670-9A 7-cylinder air-cooled radial gasoline engine. Power is transferred via a long drive shaft to the frontally mounted Synchromesh gearbox with five forward gears and one reverse gear. This allows the 11.5 ton tank to reach a maximum speed of 35 miles per hour or 56 kilometers per hour, which is significantly higher than that of most other reserve tanks, although on flat ground the vehicle will usually cruise along at only 33 miles per hour or 53 kilometers per hour. Maximum reverse speed is 4 miles per hour or 6 kilometers per hour. The tank cannot neutral steer and takes approximately 18 seconds to complete a stationary rotation in first gear. In second gear, however, this can be reduced to 7 seconds. In reverse, it takes 20 seconds to complete a full rotation of the tank. The armour consists of 25.4mm or 1 inch thickness pretty much all round on the gun mantlet and the front sides and rear of both the turret and the hull. However, there are some weaknesses. The turret ring is only 6.35mm or 1 quarter of an inch thick, same as the roof of the hull. The roof of the turret is also the same thickness. The upper glacis plate is 15.8mm or 3 fifths of an inch thick. However, it is sloped back at 69 degrees, giving it an effective thickness of around 40 millimeters, or 1 and 3 fifths inches. The mount for the bow machine gun, however, is a small vertical circle, which reduces the effective thickness of this particular area significantly. The armor consists mostly of rolled homogeneous steel plates riveted together. The gun mantlet, however, is a cast steel piece. To kill an M2A4 from the front, aim for the driver and assistant driver's hatches in the front of the superstructure. Hit the right side first, then the left. Do not aim for the turret or upper glacis, as it is likely that your shot will ricochet. From either side, hit the hull underneath the turret repeatedly. From the rear, first disable the engine, and then proceed to attack the turret. The all-round armour thickness of 25.4mm is not sufficient to stop most things fired at it, excluding rifle calibre bullets and maybe some heavy machine gun rounds. The roof armour is barely sufficient to keep out aircraft machine gun bullets, but cannon will tear straight through. The primary armament consists of a single 37mm M5 anti-tank gun, situated in the turret. The gun is unstabilised and takes about 8 seconds to alternate between its maximum depression angle of minus 6 degrees to its maximum elevation angle of plus 19 degrees. The turret is manually operated, taking roughly 24 seconds to complete a 360 degree rotation.
The M2A4 can carry a maximum of 103 shells for its primary armament, although I'd recommend carrying no more than 30 to reduce the likelihood of a shell penetration, setting off the stowed ammunition. Said ammunition stowage is located in three large racks behind and underneath the turret crew, about halfway down the inside of the hull. Ammunition choices for the 37mm gun are either the M74 armor piercing or AP shell, which can perforate 59mm of armor at 500 meters, or the M51 armor piercing capped ballistic capped or APCBC shell, which has lower penetration capability at close ranges, 66mm at 100m compared to the m 74 76mm, but at longer ranges is more capable, 43mm at 1500m compared to the m 74 31mm. Seeing as combat at that sort of range is rare in this tank, I'd recommend carrying only 5 or so M51 shells and 25 M74 shells. Reload rate of the 37mm M5 gun is around 3 to 4 seconds, which is very good for this sort of level. On the left hand side of the main gun is the optical gun sight, and on the right is the coaxial machine gun. This weapon is a 7.62mm or 0.3 inch Browning M1919A4 machine gun with 5,250 rounds and 250 round belts. There is a similar such weapon in the hull front and two more located in sponsons on either side of the crew compartment. These two are fixed in place firing forwards and are operated by the driver. A fifth 0.3 inch Browning is located on an anti-aircraft pintle mount on the back of the turret, operated by standing on the engine deck. This weapon has only 3,000 rounds of ammunition. Total secondary weapon ammunition stowage capacity is 24,000 rounds. The commander's cupola features a large forward flipping hexagonal hatch and six perspex vision blocks arranged to give the commander some all-round visibility when the hatch is closed. The hull features four perspex vision blocks, one in each of the driver's and assistant driver's forward hatches, and one on either side of the driving compartment. The driver and co-driver's forward hatches can be propped up for increased visibility when not in combat, as can the two side hatches, which are hinged at the rear. The driver's hatch also features a lower flap that is hinged to swing downwards, allowing the driver to exit. The assistant driver, who operates the bow machine gun, however, does not get such a luxury, and so has to wait for the driver to exit, or else use the emergency hatch located in the floor behind him. On either side of the engine are two fuel tanks, each containing 27 US gallons or 102 litres of gasoline, or petrol for us Europeans, for a combined total of 54 US gallons or 204 litres, which gives the light tank M2A4 a maximum range on the road of around 70 miles or 110 kilometres. But of course in War Thunder you don't need to worry about that. What you should worry about, however, is the fact that gasoline is flammable, and so a hit to the engine or fuel tanks is likely to start a fire. The running gear consists of two bogies on either side, bolted in place. This means that they can be easily removed for maintenance or replacement. Each bogey features two spoked road wheels, which have solid rubber rims. The suspension consists of two volute springs in each bogey, which compress when the wheel moves over an obstacle via a hinged arm, which pushes upwards on a sliding block. At the top of each bogey is a steel skid that prevents the tracks from catching on the bogey, as well as scraping mud off the inside of the track. Between the suspension bogies are two track return rollers on each side, which are bolted to the hull. The drive sprocket is located at the front, while the adjustable rubber rimmed idler wheel is at the back. The tracks feature two rows of outside guide teeth, are double pinned, and have rubber shoes. On most M2A4s these shoes were reversible, meaning that when one side wore down they could be flipped over to expose a fresh side to the terrain. However, as this was such a lengthy and finicky process, most crews didn't bother flipping the track shoes and just requested new tracks when one side wore down. As a result, later M2A4s had non-reversible rubber shoes on their tracks. 
The M2A4 is pretty well equipped in terms of external features, unlike the Hotchkiss H35 of last time. On the very front are two towing loops, as well as a very handy step for the driver to use when climbing up onto the tank. A handle on the upper glacis, as well as these two metal slat things, also aid in egress. Next to the bow machine gun is the horn. On each unarmoured track fender is a large uncowled headlight, protected by a brush guard. Behind, just in front of the hull sponsons, are two machine gun tripods and two large spanners, each held in place by leather straps. The sponson mounted Browning machine guns are presumably removable, allowing whoever to attach them to the tripods and use them as standard medium machine guns. The spanner on the left is an open spanner, and the one on the right is a ring spanner. Their size suggests that they are used for adjusting the rear idler wheels to change the track tension. On the left side of the tank, running the length of the hull and held in place to the fender with leather straps, is the towing rope. This is a large steel rope with steel reinforced eyes, which is necessary for the business of towing tanks about. Attached to either side of the hull superstructure are metal brackets and leather straps which hold the tank's unditching tools. On the left you've got your pickaxe, the head of which is removable for easier stowage. On the right is the shovel and a hatchet. The large metal bars covering these tools are brush guards, which also function as handholds for the crew climbing up onto the turret, as well as a handy thing to attach towing cables to should the tank flip over on its side. The handle on the top of the superstructure is either another handhold or to remove the panel revealing that something that might be a stowage compartment. The turret features these large rectangular indentations, which I believe are openable panels, which serve as either pistol ports or to increase ventilation, or indeed both. The fact that the light tank M3 lacks these suggests that they weren't a particularly good idea. On the right side of the turret is a brass placard bearing the emblem of the United States Cavalry, meaning that this is an army tank and not one belonging to the Marines. The engine deck features two large ventilation grills, the smaller one for air intake and the larger one for air expulsion. The engine is air-cooled so it has a large fan to shift all that air. On either side of the air intake is a round object. These are the fuel filler caps. Two fuel tanks, two filler caps. Not sure where the oil filler is, but it might be inside that cover that I thought was for a stowage bin. In fact, now that I think about it, it's far more likely that it's engine maintenance gubbins under there, such as the battery and oil reservoir. Behind the engine air intake, on the right hand side, is the radio antenna. It's angled back like that so that the barrel of the gun doesn't bend it too much when the turret rotates and also so it doesn't catch on trees. As often. Coming out the top of the engine deck are two exhaust pipes. Each of these lead into a rectangular muffler on the sides of the hull, before flowing into two cylindrical exhaust vents. I believe these are to disperse the exhaust smoke before releasing it, which should make the tank harder to spot from a distance. On either side of the hull rear is a red rear light, with two settings, regular night driving and convoy lights. Moving down, the hull slopes inwards at 18 degrees. Not only does this cut down on size and weight, it also encourages the air blown through the engine by the cooling fan to flow upwards and out through the rear vent. In this panel are two large engine access doors for performing maintenance. To remove the engine entirely, however, the engine deck would need to be removed. And finally at the bottom there are two more towing loops. In all, the design of this tank is pretty good. The layout is neat and efficient, the 37mm M5 is an excellent anti-tank gun and will have no trouble dealing with most enemies you'll encounter at these low levels, except maybe the Shah B1 Bis. The Browning M1919A4 is a superb machine gun with good rate of fire and very large magazine capacity. There are of course far too many of them, no tank needs five machine guns, but with them you'll chew up those gas trucks in no time at all. Also, the addition of an anti-aircraft machine gun means that you can take a few pot shots at those pesky biplanes buzzing about, and who knows, maybe you'll get lucky. 
The turret turns quickly for this tier, however the gun elevation speed is a little slow, so make sure you've got it pointing in the right direction before driving around corners to avoid any nasty surprises. The armour is not to be relied upon, but the tank makes up for that with its really very good mobility. It also has quite a high profile, necessitated by the large radial engine, but again the high mobility compensates for that somewhat. Also the transmission is in the front, and so is prone to taking damage. As far as accessories and paraphernalia are concerned, this tank is equipped fairly well. You've got your shovel, your pick and your hatchet, and you've got a pair of big old spanners as well as a couple tripods for your 30 cals. But there are still a couple of important things missing. Where for example is the jack? Where is the camouflage tarpaulin? Where are the stowage bins? And where oh where is the tank bar? Some of these items might be carried internally, of course, but I sees no evidence, I gives no points. Anyways, with all that being said, let's see how this fine hunk of American steel fares in battle, shall we? Alright, so here we are in the first battle, it didn't go too well. Uh, we're on one of the new-ish maps, North America. So we're here in uh, the Mojave Desert, by the looks of things. And we're just uh, going over to the cat point, but oh no, we're shot at from the side. And it uh, looks like there's a bunch of BTs over there. They've destroyed my turret, and my turret crew, and I be I get picked apart. So, next battle. We're on the same map again, this was uh, just after that patch rolled out. And so they wanted to show off their new map. So just knock over the cactus, who cares about the cactus? Certainly not I. And we're gonna go see what's going on in this here town. This here town is ain't big enough for the both of us, I say. Who am I saying it to? Well. You'll just have to wait and see. But yes, this this footage took place just after the last patch. There has since been another patch where we've got boats all of a sudden. So maybe I'll start doing some videos about the boats at some point. Why don't you say in the comments whether or not you want to see that? Anyway, so we knock over the fire hydrant, and we're taking a look down these alleyways. And oh ho! There's a tank there. It's a oh, it's a Char B1 bis. I fire a shot, but of course it bounces off. Now I think that the Char B1 is going to be going round the building. But then I see him coming back this way. He's gonna chase us. So we're gonna we're gonna flank round him. We're going to play a little bit of uh, merry-go-round the bushes. Whatever that means. Because of course the M2A4 is much faster than the uh, Char B1 bis. And we got to get round so we can hit the weak spot. Namely, the little ventilation grill. Uh, first shot hits the track, because uh, I'm getting a bit excited here. Second shot, it hits the grill, but... oh no. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Luckily his shot misses, and we've got a little bit of time before he reloads. He's got a rather slow reloading gun, that thing. But then he gets another shot off, and it goes into the engine. And oh no, he's going to surely defeat us now. I don't even bother repairing. And then he sets me on fire. He's shooting all the wrong places, luckily. So I'm repairing that. Still shooting at him. And oh, I get a shot through the turret ring. And another one. I'll disable his, uh, his uh, commander. Found another weak spot on the uh, Char B1 bis. His turret ring is broken. And there we go, we get a shot through and kill the commander. And knock out the Char B1. So all you people who think, oh, the only place you can shoot a Char B1 bish is through the little uh, side vent thing for the engine. Well, I found another place. 
scientific research, don't you know? So now that we've dealt with that behemoth, it's time to go and capture this capture this point. And uh oh, there's a BT. We take out his engine, his most powerful asset, but then the tree falls over, so I can't see him. So I've got to hose down the area with my machine gun, see where he is. Second shot hits the uh, fuel tank. Doesn't explode because we don't have explosive ammunition. Third shot, however, does set him on fire, and then the fourth one goes into the turret and blows him up. So we've captured the point. Now we're going to go look for more pesky Russians and/or Frenchmen to go and have a stern talking to. I'll be cautious around these suburbs. Who knows what kind of red neck hillbillies might be hiding just behind that car I can sort of hear something I think there's an aeroplane buzzing out out might take a few shots at him later knock over this picket fence and hanging around in this fella's garden or yard, as I'm sure the you Americans would say. Uh, oh, oh, there's there's another BT. I uh, shoot my machine guns at him, but it looks like he's already dead. There's something going on here, though. That was a friend, so his ammunition didn't hurt us. Surely there's got to be something over here, but then all of a sudden the enemies start capturing A, so we better hot foot it over there and get it back. Can't be having them taking our capture point from underneath our noses. No siree. There's a there's a ho ha or a ho hum, whatever it's called. The derp gun on a chassis. Drop some artillery on the A point. And we're getting closer. Gonna cut, cut through this this alleyway, sort of. And there he is, there's one. It looks to be maybe a BT. Just checking the corners, just in case. He's gone round the back of the church. There he is! There he is! Oh no, he's already dead. And so, we, we, we've got to capture the point back. But then, oh no, there's an aeroplane. He's attacking us, he is. He blows up that poor man's house. Artillery starts dropping, and I think about replenishing my crew, but I decide, no, we can't. Knock over a priceless American 50s car. We don't have time to replenish our crew. There's the aeroplane. We get a few hits in him, it looks to be a I-15. Still hitting him, but of course this is only a 30 caliber machine gun, so he won't do very much in the way of damage. A whole bunch of us are opening up on him. But then, he starts turning towards us, and he's gonna shoot at me. Haha, <laughs> my armor is impervious to your machine guns, and then he flies into a building. And I get the kill for it. Because I am just amazing, aren't I? <laughs> right, so now that we've shot down an aeroplane of all things, it's time to go and uh, patrol the other the spawn point, uh, the capture points, and indeed the spawn point. Make sure no uh, enemies are gonna crawl out of the woodwork, so to speak. There's a Tetrarch and another funny looking tank over there. And oh ho! Oh, gunfire! That usually means there's an enemy. Look over that tree. And I can't see anything.
bunch of Japanese tanks around here. Oh! Oh, it's a... Oh, it's one of those French Kegres half-tracks. And so we're just camping the spawn point. Because it's the end of the battle and that's what you do. It's not a glamorous thing to do. But sometimes it is necessary. If you do it in the middle of the battle when there's still points to be captured, then I say, oh, that's not on. But if you do it at the end of the battle when everything's pretty much over anyway, well, it's the only thing you really can do, isn't it? Just pointing the gun to the side of a building. to be anything down there, apart from a few cars. Uh oh, another aeroplane. That looks like a... Oh, I don't know what that is. You, pr you can probably see what it is, but my editing screen is far too low resolution. Hang on a minute, is the engine grill disappeared? It has! You can see straight down into the engine. Hmm. Pretty cool. Must have been destroyed when the Shah B1 shot at us. But then all of a sudden, A is being captured. And I'm typing something. I'm sure it's very amusing, but I can't read it because, as I said, editing screen. So we gotta go see what's over here at the A point. What is over here? Well, I imagine there is an enemy tank. And we drive into the side of the church. Creeping cautiously, I see some tracer fire. Through a blown up building. And we're capturing now. So we bet it got to be on on our toes. Something's exploded round here. It might have been the enemy tank that was here. Just keeping a little bit of an eye out, just in case. But we've got a whole bunch of friends now, so I'm sure we've got nothing to worry about. Hello, Mr. BT. And it turns out I can't drive through this garage, so I just repair the tank anyway. Start reloading the ammunition, replenishing the crew, and putting the tracks back on. Nearly there. And here we go. Off to more adventure. Although, it's not going to be much adventuring going on because the battle's pretty much over. It's a pea shooter flying over, and there we go. Blowed up two tanks, shot down one aeroplane, and I think that's not good enough. Let's go again. Let's have another battle. Let's have a more exciting one. So, here we are in North America again. Because, as I said, they're showing off this map. And we're on the other spawn point this time. So we're going to go down and head towards A, the station. In fact, no, we're going to go head towards B, because A has already been captured. So we're just driving along this little dirt, dirt track. Seeing what we can see. Shooting what we can shoot. Yeah, you can see just how huge this tank really is. Tanks really are big. Even the little ones. We're knocking over this lamp post. Uh, forming up behind this uh, ho row. 
There's another one behind us. And uh, is there anything we can catch by? No, it doesn't look like it. We're going to duck into this alleyway and approach it from this side. Keeping an eye out on all the uh, possible points of entry. Oh, that was a Japanese tank. I oh, very nearly shot at him. So then they, it sounds like oh, they're they're sh they're having a bit of trouble. They're shooting at something. So we're going to go round behind them, see what we can shoot at from behind. Aha! There's a Panzer III! Yeah, we take them out, we caught them by surprise! Yeah, so that'll, uh, that'll uh, free up our little Japanese buddies! So, heading towards A now, which the enemy appear to, appear, appear to have captured. There goes the train. It's nice that they got a moving train in this game it goes. In the middle of a war zone. That would be something to see on your morning commute. So we're heading still towards A. There's uh, another one of our little Japanese friends. And into the swarm uh, catch point. There's nothing around. Unless there's something over there. They'd go and investigate. You sure there's nothing hiding behind this? These these car these train cars. So I think I can hear something on the other side. So I'm just going to go around and have a little check around the front of the locomotive. But when I go around, there's nothing there. Spooky. I probably would know what kind of locomotive that is, except I haven't played Open TTD in a while, don't you know? Mm. Hopping over this fence, so all the all the uh, hooligans can go and spray their graffiti all over the train, because apparently that's what people like to do. And now we're going to go ahead towards C. Going through B, down along Main Street. Uh, but all of a sudden I hear something going on over here. Maybe there's something that I'll have to go and investigate. What is there, you say? I don't know. Thought I heard gunfire. Just you don't knock over the septic tank. And you do knock over this crappy little fence. And I decide now was whatever was here, it's probably not here anymore. I'm gonna go and capture C. All by myself. So we're trundling along Main Street, taking in the sights. Maybe stop off at the uh, drug store to get a malt. Maybe go down to the uh, the oh, I don't know what diner. Pick up some chicks. Go down to the lookout point do whatever it is people do there look at the scenery I imagine I do hear more gunfire going on all over the place but then uh, oh no A's being captured as well well no time to do anything about that just drive into this concrete barrier um, go, 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 see I see something on my mini-map there's a tank. He's appearing to wanting to be capturing B. So we're going to pull the old flanking trick again. We're going to come round behind him. 
I'm taken by surprise. Aha, uh -huh. I see tire tracks or track tracks. There he is. Oh, Lamb Moses, that's a, that's a battleship. Along with a little French tank. Well, we take out his transmission. And then we shoot at the French tank. Take him out, he's the bigger threat, I think. The T-35. He doesn't know just where we are. We'll blow him up completely. So, here we are, the M2A4. Giant killer! I don't care about no fire hydrant. So let's be lawfully protected. Now it's off to sea. Uh, take it into the hands of justice and ensure that it is properly protected. That crazy pea shooter pilot pummeling the pavement with his. Gun. What's that? Is that a tank? Yes, that's a tank. So oh, that's another French tank. They're easy to kill. They've only got two crew members, although that particular one is the one with three. No matter. Oh, oh look, look out! Surprise! Boom! Right through the rear hatch. It's nice when people don't know where you are. So now we're going to continue creeping towards sea, keeping an eye out for any more French tanks. Doesn't appear to be anything else here. So we're going to return it to rightful hands. Owners. Hmm. Hanging around in this churchyard. So we're taking up our vigilance point. There's a Japanese flak truck. Something has captured B, so I'm going to drop some artillery on it. Oh no, no, they're capturing A as well. Well, we better go and put a stop to this. It's shenanigans, I call it. Let's just replenish the ammunition. See how quickly the ammunition replenishes in this tank. It's very useful. They, you, know, you could probably get away with just carrying 20 shells, if you really wanted to. But I like to carry 30. 30 is a good number. Unless, of course, I'm also carrying smoke shells, in which case I'll carry 33. Uh oh. Something has happened over here. Better. Oh no. We were attacked from behind by a, by a Panzer II. Oh, he completely took us by surprise. So, our lucky streak. It, uh... Well, it's over. So I figured that battle was that was good enough, but, uh, you know, it does go on. We fly a pea shooter a little bit, shoot at whatever this thing is. French aeroplane. We can outmaneuver those French monoplanes. Easy. Of course I can't aim. But, uh, yeah. And we shoot him down with our mighty, mighty 50 caliber machine gun. And there's a tank over there, I drop my bombs, but fly into a building. And the bombs don't do anything. And, thirdly, uh oh, spoilers for the next American tank it's the LVTP3. Blow up a little French tank. But I won't show you any more because that's spoilers. And finally, we take out the M2A2. Everyone's favourite little two turreted crack tank. Shoot our piddly little machine gun at whatever that was. Now we're gonna go and capture A. There he is. Don't need to worry about the train coming. He's already come and gone. Or at least I think so. Now we're going to hide behind this train. But unfortunately, we run out of time. So, there you have it. 
the M2A4 light tank. It is an excellent tank, I think. Everything, well, pretty much everything about it is good. It's got an excellent gun that fires very rapidly. You won't get a shot through the side of a Sha B1 base, but then not many things can at this sort of level. And uh, you know, for everything else, it's perfectly adequate. It's got a whole bunch of machine guns, even an anti-aircraft machine gun, so if you're a good shot with it, you can shoot down those pesky Russian biplanes. It's very fast, and it's very maneuverable. You can turn, or turn it on a dime as long as you're not you know, uh, in first gear. And, uh, yeah. The only thing not going for it is the armor, and even that's not bad, you know, it'll keep out machine gun bullets. And at this sort of level, that's all you can really expect. So, there you have it. I would highly recommend the M2A4. Especially if you've just started playing the game, and you have no idea what you're doing. This is a very forgiving tank even though the armor's not that good. So, uh, you, know, you can um, get the hang of things before moving on to more refined tastes, such as the Hotchkiss and the, the Cruiser Mark III. So, there you have it. Yeah, M2A4. Thank you very much for watching, and hopefully you'll join us for the next one, where we'll be taking a little look at everyone's favourite German biplane, the Heinkel HE-51. That is, of course, if I decide not to start looking at boats immediately. I probably will do them eventually, but I don't really feel like it right now, because I don't have any. I need to unlock some. So yes, HE-51 next. Hopefully that won't be demonetized, because it's a German aeroplane and therefore controversial. But then, of course, none of these are actually monetized yet. But I'm not concerned about that, I just want to bring you the content that you, the viewer, deserve. So yes, hopefully you'll join us for that one, and hey, if you like the channel, then, uh, well, you, you, you can uh, press the subscribe button, maybe. Uh, that would make me very happy. Oh yes, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. My life has seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His troop is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His troop is marching on. Of a hundred circling camps, they have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damp. I can read his righteous presence by the dim and flaring lamp. His day is marching on. That shall never call retreat. He is lifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on.
beauty of the village Christ was born across the sea With a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free While God is mine 